Hi everyone, you've all received your contract assignments back now and I hope you have all had an opportunity to read carefully the email that I sent to you um, because I'm taking that as a given, all right? Um, what I'd like to do in this video is go through the contract assignment grading memo so that you can understand where you lost marks, where you uh, didn't, and also uh, give you the information that will be used on the quiz. Now, talking about the quiz, um, I reiterate that the quiz will be only on the material covered in this video and a video following this. Now I'm going to have two videos, one to deal with this assignment and then one to deal with the contract drafting sheet that I have posted to eLearn because I want to have that video available in case uh, in the summer term we're still doing online. <clears throat> anyway, um, so the, the quiz is only on this material and the material on that drafting sheet that I've posted to eLearn. The format will be fill in the blanks or very short answers. It's about two pages long. It's intended to be 20 minutes. I'm going to give you half an hour to do it. Um, you have to know the material. It is an opportunity for you to gain ground if you are unsatisfied with your mark on the contract assignment as it is. That does not mean that it is easy. You either know the material, and in which case you'll get a mark and you'll be able to improve your grade in the course, or if you think, oh, well, I'll just look it up, you know, fill in blanks, uh-uh, you are going to bomb. All right, <clears throat> so that's the quiz. Now, um, a lot of marks were lost on the contract assignment because students did not follow directions. There actually was not a lot of law in here. Like, oh, I'm drafting a contract. Oh my God, I'm not a lawyer. How can I do this? No, all basically you had the contract precedent and you had things that you had to put in it. And things that I reminded you to do and a lot of you didn't and that's why you lost marks. From now on, in all your courses at Kaplan University, when you get an assignment like this, sit down and make a list. These are the things that I have to give the instructor back. Do your assignment and then check them off, okay? Um, two precedents. Why two? Um, I actually had people say, um, why are the three contracts up there? They emailed me, which means they obviously hadn't read the instructions and they obviously had not looked at the materials, okay? So you gotta remember to do that sort of stuff. Um, now, um, <laughs> as an aside, I thought the bug basher was really quite humorous. Um, I, I always try to look for funny things to put into my problems and on my exams and everything, hopefully to interject a little bit of humor into the course. And you're all so serious that n nobody goes, wow, what a funny thing, ha ha ha. Uh, anyway. Uh, that, as an aside, I mean, maybe I should just use widgets. That's what Harvard University uses. Oh, we'll use widgets because we're so important, so we're going to invent this thing called a widget. Nobody knows what it is, so nobody can argue against it. Whatever. Anyway, I've ordered the bug batcher and uh, didn't get one laugh from it that I know. <laughs> All right, back to the material. Um, Two precedents. Why? Well, because I have lots of precedents that could fit in a contract, and I don't have one precedent that fits every contract. Otherwise, I would make a fortune. Um, so I had two, and I had to choose the best one uh, that I felt, and then perhaps use um, sections or clauses from one and put it in the other and mold a, a contract that was really good for my client. Uh, <clears throat> For example, in the dealership agreement, um, there was a force majeure clause. In this day of pandemics, the first thing that should come to your mind if you're entering into a contract is, should I put a force majeure clause in there to protect myself in case of a pandemic which closes down my business and will put me in a position where I cannot fulfill my contractual obligations? So a force majeure clause says the contract is suspended. I can't operate because I'm told I'm a non-essential business um, and therefore I cannot meet my contractual commitments. The contract is suspended until such time as um, I am up and running again. And then at that point, <clears throat> you can fulfill the contract obligation, but you can't be cannot be sued for breach of contract. Okay, so that was one. In the dis distribution ship, 
the distributorship agreement, um, there was a termination clause that said, this contract shall be enforced for one year, and after that, on 90 days' notice, either party can terminate it. That, if you use the dealership contract, you should use that distributorship clause. Why? Because I'm paying $25,000 to buy the distribution rights. If you can terminate my, clause, or my contract on 30 days' notice, I've paid you $25,000 and you get to keep it. Wow, I get ta nothing. Okay, so the <clears throat> part of the instruction said you had to draft a contract to be as fair as possible to both sides. So if I'm paying you $25,000 to the ex get the exclusive rights to the distribution area, then I, I want to be it to be fair and allow me a chance to you know make my money back before you can terminate it. Okay, um, inappropriate terms. Um, in the uh, distributorship agreement, there was export machine price list. <coughs> What's an export machine price list? Gee, I don't know. Then why leave it in? Just think it through, export machine price list. It's the price of my equipment when I'm exporting it. Is Walter a Wizzo? Wizzo. Wizzo exporting? No, he's not. So take it out. Put the price, just leave price list. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then a little later on in the in the contract, it says what happens if um, the contract is terminated rightfully. Well, what it means in a situation like that is that you have to, if the person has some product and they can no longer sell it, he has to give it back to you. But if he's already paid you for it, then how much money does he get from you when he returns the product? Well, <clears throat> this distribution agreement assumed that the product was being imported by the distributor and then, or in, by the company, and then given to a distributor. So there would be a CIF price, cost, insurance, and freight. The cost of the product plus the cost of insurance and freight to get it to Canada. So that's what you would buy the equipment from me for, or for, at that amount, and so that's what you would expect to get back. But wait a minute, Walter Wisdo is making these in Vernon, so he's not importing them, so you've got to get that price, that out of there. Um, so if you left those in, you lost a half a mark each. Uh, okay, so that's the distribution uh, agreement, but what happens if you use the dealer agreement? Well, there's fleet and government accounts. You can have a fleet of cars, but you cannot have a fleet of bug bashers. So obviously you might have a government account. Um, you might want to sell these in large amounts to the government of Canada. Why? Why? Well, because they have a lot of people working in parks all around the country. And they might want to use them. And so they want to get a fleet, no, a government account discount, okay? So I'm not going to sell them to you and allow you to sell them to the government of Canada. I want to do it, and so I, that clause is in there to protect me, Walter Wisdo. I can sell to the government, but you can't. But you've got to get fleet out. There's not, no such thing as a fleet of uh, bug bashers. Um, and then the other one was uh, Superior Court. When I was going through Chapter 1, we got to the court system in British Columbia. I mentioned that at one point it said um, you, uh, you can start your cause of action in the Superior Court. And then I very clearly said the Superior Court is an overall term used in this example on the internet, but every province has their own Superior Court. This contract was for Ontario. They call it the Superior Court. In BC, we don't have a Superior Court. We have a Supreme Court. So if you didn't change that, you lost a half a mark. So those are the ki kinds of inappropriate terms. If you're dealing, if you looked at the dealer agreement, you came across a phrase, mutatis mutandis. Did anybody look that up? It should stay in, but it would be a good idea to look that up rather than leave it in the contract. Oh, it sounds legal, I think I'll leave it in because that could come back and haunt you. Um, all right, inappropriate clauses. Now we had to be fair to both parties and I think I've already talked about it, the uh, clause uh, w which allows one party to discontinue the contract on 30 days notice. Man, that would be you know a disaster for, um, uh, 
for the, uh, Dilbert Dabble's company because yeah, you know they they pay twenty five thousand dollars and then Walter Wizzo can terminate the contract on thirty days notice, or he can say, well, I cannot terminate the contract on thirty days notice because I have to wait a year and nine months. But hey, you know what I can do is I can discontinue making the product. Well, again, that would be totally unfair, so that clause had to be taken out. So that was only a half a mark off. Um, uh, things to include, um, there was a long list of negotiation terms. Uh, the manufacturer is obliged to provide a thousand per month. Why? Why would you put that in there? Why doesn't he sell? I, I hope he sells 150,000 of these things because Walter Wizzo probably cannot produce that many bug bashers. Yeah, he's a small manufacturer in Vernon. So he says, okay, I can supply up to a thousand a month plus meet my own needs, but I cannot guarantee that I can provide more than that. So if you go out and you sell uh, 1,750, that would be great, but you cannot then come back and say, hey, you're in breach of contract because you cannot give me that many. So he's obligated to supply up to a thousand. He may be able to expand and he may be able to provide more later, but you can always amend the contract, right? So that had to be put in there. Now he gives him 10 demos. Um, he's, Dilbert Dabble has to go out and, and show somebody, hi, you want to buy a bug basher? What the heck is that? Well, it says gizmo. No, you got to show them, right? So he wants to have 10 demos. He's going to use some, some of his salespeople are going to use some, they're going to go and say, hey, look, <laughs> keeps the bugs away. No, uh, no pollutants in the atmosphere or in the uh, environment. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Walter Wizzo is going to give him 10. Why bother putting it in the contract? Because he's giving it to him. This contract is really, really deals with what um, uh, Dabble Distributing is purchasing or, or <laughs> is, is going to be able to purchase. Um, well, it's part of the deal. And if you do not put it in there, um, then <clears throat> um, Dabble isn't, is not going to be able to come back later and say, hey, you didn't put it in there. And you go, why would I? Yeah, this is what you're buying. Um, that I'm giving it to you free. And, you know, Dabble says, oh, well, okay. And then Walter Wizard doesn't give him 10. He says, no, no, you have to buy those. Dabble says, oh, no, no, it's part of the deal. Walter Wisdo says, hey, it's not in the contract. It's not part of the deal. It was just a gratuitous promise, a promise made in the absence of a bargain. I said I'd give it to you, but I haven't given them to you yet, so I don't have to. You have to buy them. That's uh, That comes to the parole evidence rule, which we'll deal with more later on. Okay, and then you get into the uh, quotas. Now, if you have a distribution agreement, you have to have quotas in there. Okay, I had a client in West Vancouver who sold FOBs uh, for on the beer, uh, on the line, uh, from the beer keg to the faucet, okay? And the idea is, um, those beer kegs uh, have uh, C CO2 gas coming into them, and it pushes the beer out, so that the guy behind the bar goes, are you know, matey, a full head of beer. <coughs> Pardon me. Anyway, um, he had one of those fobs, and he had the patent on it. And he was producing them in the West Vancouver, a very small producer, just like Walter Wizzle. Along comes one of the biggest beer distributors in the United States and says, hey, I want the exclusive rights to distribute your product in the United States. Ching, ching, dollar signs pop up into my client's eyes. So he signs this agreement, and it's a, you know, standard contract, so like, why show your lawyer, right? So he signs this agreement, and then it turns out this huge company in the United States wasn't selling any of his. So he did some investigating and find, found out that that company in the States had the exclusive rights to distribute his FOB and the exclusive rights to distribute a FOB from Europe. And the FOB from Europe was about the same price in the marketplace, but the company in the United States had a higher profit margin on that one. So he would go and he'd go, hey, you want to buy this one or this one? And, you know, I think this was the better one. And he'd sell those, and he was using my client's FOB as a loss leader, okay? Um, so uh, <clears throat> my client came in to me, and he said, hey, this guy isn't selling any. Um, I want to terminate the contract. And I went, oh, okay, well, um, what was your quota limit? Like, he's obviously not meeting his quota if he isn't selling any, and therefore you can terminate the contract. He goes, oh, well, no, uh, me, uh, mm, uh, 
I didn't put any quotas in there. Oh, okay, well, what's the termination clause say? Does it say you can terminate on 30 days notice or can you terminate um, uh, on 90 days notice after a year? And you went, eh, well, um, hmm. didn't put a termination clause in there. So my client had a contract that was going to be in existence forever and the U.S. company was obligated to do hmm, nothing. So you got to have those quotas in there, okay? Um, and then the other thing is um, uh, <clears throat> he was obligated to use POP material. Um, now I think I defined what POP material was in the um, in the problem, hoping that you would actually go out and learn something. Did I? POP material. No. What's POP material? Well, it's point of purchase material. If anyone was taking marketing, you'd know what it is. <clears throat> Otherwise, you just have to, you know, Google it and find out. So POP material. So those, those clauses have to go in. And I had a lot of people who would say, okay, well, I'll put in the, the quotas, but I don't have to put in the thousand dollar or the thousand units because, you know, it's, it's sort of maybe covered by the quotas. Or um, they would put in um, uh, POP, uh, or they wouldn't put in POP because that sounded like, you know, not really serious or whatever. I don't know. But you again, you make a list and you go, okay, is it in there? No, it isn't. Okay, I better get it in. Um, and then the uh, the other thing was FOB. What's free FOB mean? Oh, free on board. No, that isn't what it means. That's what the acronym stands for. But what's free on board or FOB mean? Well, it makes a big difference. I had one contract who said, oh, well, uh, okay, FOB must mean I have to deliver it to Dabble Distributing Inc. Um, okay, so, um, gosh, let's see. <clears throat> well, I'll just put that in and leave the FOB out. Well, that means that Walter Whistler would have to pay the transportation costs from Vernon to, I don't know, wherever Dabble Distributing is, probably in Vancouver. He would have to pay. And he'd have to insure that because during the trans transportation of the goods, um, it would be at Walter Wisso's risk. That's not FOB. FOB means I will put it free on board whatever transportation you send to my plant. Once the goods leave my loading dock and go across the rail of the ship, risk passes to the buyer to dabble distributing ink. Dabble Distributing Inc. pays from that point on, okay? So it's really important to have it in there. If you used um, the dealer agreement and you put it in, everything was fine. If you used the distrib distributor's agreement and you put it in, um, there was a trap. And that is you had to read through. And in Schedule A, it said um, FOB, FOR, or otherwise. Well, you've got to get FOR or otherwise out of there because that's not part of the deal. What's FOR mean? Well, I don't know, so I left it in. No, bad, 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 bad. You're going to get, you're going to wind up paying to get it down to the railway yard because FOR means free on rail, okay? Or otherwise, oh, well, I'd rather have it X works, thanks, which means Dabble has to pay for everything right up until it's delivered to Dabble's place of business, including insurance, okay? So you can't, you got to get that out of there conflicts. So if you did not put FOB in, you lost a mark. If you put that in and you had a conflicting FOR or otherwise, you would only lose half a mark. Okay. All right. It's pretty clear what you lose things for here. Um, in that warranty in the distribution agreement, you had to read it all the way through. And I think a lot of people got there and you go, oh, you know, this is as exciting as uh, a root canal. So you stopped reading. Oh, this is the warranty. It's got to be okay. Well, at the bottom of the warranty, it said, um, uh, including the cost for tires, electrical systems, and fuel injection systems. Cars have tires. Bug bashers don't. Um, you might get away with electrical systems because it's an electric thing. But fuel injection, if it's electric powered, I don't think it's going to have fuel injection. Okay, so you had to get that out and you'd lose a half a mark. Uh, okay, um, I told you to put in 
your um, calculations and I told you to uh, calculate uh, the interest owing on a per diem basis um, and not monthly. Okay, and I also mentioned that when uh, I did a Zoom or whatever. All right, why? Well, there's two reasons why you cannot charge monthly interest. The first is that <clears throat> the goods or the money is outstanding from November the 16th to December the 15th. That is not a month. That is only 29 days. So it would be illegal to charge a month's interest when it's only 29 days. Okay, one day, eh, no biggie, right? But here's the other reason why it's illegal. If you charge interest on a monthly basis, you must, absolutely must, in the contract, indicate what the per diem daily rate is. Um, years ago, when my wife and I first bought a house, we had a mortgage. Fortunately, it wasn't huge, but it was a good chunk of money. And um, interest rates uh, were 11%. Uh, uh, you know, right now they're, I don't know what they are, but they're really low. Okay. But back then, um, we were in a bit of a, a depressed economy and the banks were charging 11%. Um, and interest rates were going up. Now, um, our mortgage came up for renewal because they only give you a, a mortgage for a certain number of years and then you have to renew. And the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, who is our bank, gave us a wonderful deal. 14%. <laughs> we were lucky. The interest rates went up to even as high as 18%, but we only had to pay 14%. Only 14%. Um, that's a huge amount of money. Anyway, um, at that time, the National Trust made an offer to lawyers, not to accountants, just to lawyers. 13%. 13% .13 $13 is better than 14% on $213,000 or $250,000. So um, I went to CIBC and I said, look, I'm, you know, we're gonna, I, I think I'm going to have to go with the National Trust. And the CIBC said, yeah, sure, we understand. Um, and then I looked at the special ad that they sent out for lawyers, and it said 13% monthly. And so I called National Trust and I said, okay, what is 13% monthly on a per annum basis? And they went, what do you mean? And I said, well, I want to know, what the, what the, you know if, the, if the rates are equivalent. Is 13% monthly? Uh, the same as 13% per annum, uh, you know, daily. And they said, uh, well, you know, what do you mean? I mean, obviously you're paying 13% monthly. I mean, you know what you're paying. And I said, no, 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 that's not what I'm asking. I mean, I can figure out what I'm going to have to pay. But what I want to know is, what is the per annum rate? And they said, well, we don't understand. What do you, what you mean by that? So I asked to speak to a supervisor, and I got the same thing. Hey, 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 we're giving a special rate to lawyers. And I thought, something's wrong here. So I went back to CIBC and I said, look, <clears throat> they're offering 13% monthly, you're offering 14. What is 13% monthly? And they said, oh, the equivalent per annum rate is 14.973% or something like that. So they were charging monthly and it was actually working out to almost a percentage more than the per annum daily rate, okay? And... Um, and I thought, oh, great, now I've already told CIBC that I'm not going with them, which means I now have to make an application for a mortgage, and I have to do a, uh, you know, have an appraisal done on my house, and there'll be an application fee and processing fee. And CIBC said, you know, don't worry, Mr. Rolney, you've been a really good client for a long time. Um, we'll, we'll forget all that, and we'll just renew it 14%. I mean, you know, I'm going to be fair, because I usually beat up banks, all right? Um, but, you know, they didn't have to do that, but they did. Okay, so on the one hand, they were being really nice, and I appreciated that. Um, on the other hand, when they're charging 14%, you know, they're, you know, squeezing, you know, blood out of a stone already. Um, but they did renew, all right? So um, the whole point of that story, and I do have stories, and I apologize. Um, the whole point of that story is the federal government said, we don't like that. 
it's completely legal. They told you, Mr. Holden, that you're paying 13% monthly. So they're not, they're not, it's not false, okay? Um, and it's not misleading, okay? They didn't say it's better than. They just said 13%. So it's not false and misleading. So it does not offend the advertising uh, prohibition in the Competition Act. But we don't like it because it's sort of unethical. And so the federal government passed a law called the Canada Interest Act, okay? And that says that if a business quotes monthly, they also have to give you the equivalent per annum rate, okay? And I am going to post, ooh, I don't know whether I can. Um, I don't know whether I have it. I hope to post um, a copy of, a, yeah, I do have it, a Form B mortgage that you, when you're getting a mortgage, you have to file at a land title office. There's a place on there that says interest rate. And then down below it says the equivalent per annum interest rate pursuant to the Canada Interest Act. Okay, so in, in that particular one that I'll post, the interest rate was already the per diem rate, so it said NA down below. But if the interest rate up top said 13% monthly, down below they would have to put 14.9735% or whatever it was. <coughs> and I'll, I'll post that to... Um, e-learn so that you can have a look at it, just so that you know I'm uh, telling you the truth. <laughs> in this day and age with a guy like Trump in the United States, you have to sort of say something and then prove it. <laughs> um, okay, so that's that. Um, <coughs> territory. Let's talk about the territory. All of BC, excluding the area around Vernon, well, you could say the area around Vernon is BC. And so that's not very clear. And the reason that you um, create a contract uh, is for certainty's sake. And uh, two of my students, um, Langford, uh, included a map, and I can't remember the other students, so I apologize, but two of my students did actually put in maps with an area marked. This is the area around Vernon, and they put it in Schedule B, which I thought was great. Bingo. Bonus marks. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, my allergies are kicking up again. Um, all right, so that's that. Um, now, if you just put in area around Vernon, um, I, I think I only took off a half a mark. Um, but you could also lose a whole mark if you didn't put it in. And where you, a lot of people did not put it in was they're right in the dealer agreement. It says the territory as defined in Schedule A here too. So, done. Well, yeah, you are as long as there's a Schedule A. Okay, but there was, you know, I nine times out of ten I'd go down there and there's sh Schedule B. Um, C, I think it was, but no Schedule A. In the dealer agreement, there were no schedules attached. They were talked about schedules, but there were no schedules attached, right? So you're sitting there, oh, yeah, Mr. Holden, but I'm just a student in first year. And I looked at it, and I, d I didn't understand what it meant to have Schedule A attached. Had you looked at both precedents and thought it through, the distributorship agreement showed you Okay, there's the whole agreement. You get down to the signature lines. And then there was another agreement attached, or um, an, something attached after the signature lines, and it was called Schedule A. So that was a perfect example of how it should be done. So you had an example. Um, uh, and so, unfortunately, if you did not put in the schedules, um, <clears throat> Schedule A says, uh, uh, you know, territory is described in Schedule A. No Schedule A, no territory. And then the goods is described in Schedule B, um, no Schedule B, no goods described. Um, so that was that was one of the problems. All right, um, the parties to the agreement. Right off the bat, and I dealt with this in the video, the introductory video for the course, and at that time I actually said this is the only thing that you have to remember for examination purposes or your contract assignment from the introductory lecture. 
most of it was just getting telling you about the course and telling you about my background and my qualifications and and going through the course outline and things like that but when I started talking about um, that diagram of things that could happen in the office during any particular day um, <clears throat> I had a couple of selected things that I talked about and then I specifically talked about the check okay I talked about parties all right and I talked about signature lines signature lines signature lines you get down to <clears throat> um, item 12 on the contract assignment grading memo and it says as to the signatures in the contract assignment and um, when I did the zoom um, I said um, very clearly set up the signature lines now you look at the agreement and it has a place where it says signature lines go here does that sound like they're set up? And if that was good enough, why would I say you had to set up the signature lines? Okay, so what I was looking for here was Walter Wizzo is a sole proprietor. Okay, some people say, well, I'm going to call it uh, Bug Basher Manufacturing Inc. Hey, hey, yeah, we'll create a company. You're changing the, the, the problem. You cannot do that. I said you could add. Um, facts, addresses, things like that, but you cannot change the um, the, uh, the setup. So Walter Wizzo is a sole proprietor. Walter Wizzo, DBA, Bug Badger Manufacturing. DBA, doing business as. Okay, how do you set up a sole proprietorship? We'll get into that in uh, chapter eight, I think it is. Well, you go down, in, or seven, you go down and you register and get a business license at the city hall. Okay. And it'll say Walter Wizzo doing business as Bug Basher Manufacturing. He's the legal entity. Bug Basher Manufacturing does not exist. Okay, Nichols Bakery on Lonsdale used to have the best donuts. If I bit on a donut and broke a tooth because there was a, a rock in the flour, I could not sue Nichols Bakery. It doesn't exist. I can only sue a legal entity. So I have to go down to the municipal hall Look for Walter Wisdo's name, doing business as Nichols Bakery. And then I sue Walter Wisdo. Okay, you have to sue a real person. Okay, so you have to have the signature line of a real person, not Bug Basher. But if there was a line, Bug Basher signs here, I gave everybody the mark. Okay, <clears throat> but you get to dabble distributing ink. Inc. is a corporation. I said, if it's a corporation, it'll end in LTD, Inc. or Corp. Okay, so how does that sign? Well, we're going to get into that in the um, next video. But you have to have the name of the corporation. Then down below you have a line. But at the beginning of the line it says per. And then underneath authorized signatory. Okay, Because per means I'm signing on behalf of the corporation. Okay, <clears throat> So um, in their authorized signatory is the world according to Peter Holden saying once again, let's put both of those things on there. Per is the only thing that's legally required, but authorized signatory is another indication to the judge that I have no intention of being personally bound to that contract. Okay, well, that's how you set it up. Now, I did say there has to be a line for a guarantor. Um, well, that isn't fair. I mean, the contract is between Walter Wisdo and Dabble Distributing Inc., and you said be fair to both parties. Uh, but why should uh, Dilbert Dabble have to sign a personal guarantee? Well, because his corporation is being financed. And <clears throat> ask him, hey, Dilbert, um, do you intend to pay me through your company? Oh, yeah, for sure, absolutely. Oh, okay, well, then sign the personal guarantee. But I don't want to in case the, the company goes bankrupt, and then I won't have to pay because I'll be able to hide behind the corporate veil. But I thought you just said you, uh, you were going to pay me. Well, yeah, but, you know, but, 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 well, there's no good reason in a situation like that why Dilbert Dabble should not back up his company. <clears throat> Does he plan to have his company not pay? If he's dancing around, maybe he plans not to pay, and then you'll be stuck with the debt against the company. The company has no assets, and he's going off with the money, okay? Um, but you get him on the hook. Okay, so he's going to sign. So we've got a signature line for Walter Wisdo, we've got a signature line for the corporation, and one more line under which Dabble, or pardon me, Dilbert Dabble. Not enough. You have to have a red seal on there. 
and chapter on the corporations. I talked about SEALs. I'm going to post some information to eLearn about SEALs as well, which you should know for the quiz. You have to have a SEAL. If you don't have a SEAL, it's not going to be binding on him. Why? Because his company is getting consideration, financing, and the benefits of the contract. Walter Wisdo is getting consideration. He's getting 25 grand plus the benefits of the contract. What's Dilbert Dabble getting? Oh, he's getting consideration. No, he isn't getting any consideration. His company is, and that's a separate legal entity from him. Ergo, he has to sign under seal. <clears throat> um, on both uh, contracts, it said signed, sealed, and delivered, um, and you'd lose a half mark if, um, uh, if you did not have a seal there. The seal must be affixed at the time or before the contract is signed. All right, but that was one of the things that nobody got, and so I gave everybody the mark. Okay. Um, all right, and I think that's just about everything. The parties. Termination. Ontario law and arbitration. Oh, yeah, I got to talk about those. Um, this is an Ontario contract. Okay. Um, and it says, um, uh, this contract shall be construed in accordance with the laws of the province of Ontario. You had to change that. Okay. We talked in, in chapter uh, one, um, and I think again in chapter, no, definitely in chapter three and probably in chapter one about how you should have a choice of law clause. Okay. This contract shall be construed in accordance with the laws of the province of British Columbia. And, um, uh, a lot of most people changed that. The ones that didn't either didn't think it through or um, didn't read it. Okay. Now arbitration. When I was dealing with arbitration in the video, I very clearly and very pointedly said I have never drafted a contract in the last ten years that I did not put an arbitration clause in. I said every contract should have an arbitration clause and then you guys go and you draft a contract and pff, whatever you said in the lecture doesn't really apply to a, to a you know an assignment in the course. I mean like how could it, right? <clears throat> Just teasing. So obviously I was expecting you to go, oh, we have a contract assignment. Maybe I should put in an arbitration clause. If you use the dealership contract, no arbitration clause. You lost a half a mark. If you use the other one, there was an arbitration clause in there, but it said international commercial arbitration. Unfortunately, <clears throat> international commercial arbitration, this is not an international contract. And uh, so I was expecting, and one person did. <coughs> Let me see if he's got his name. Uh, no, but a student with the last name Deef very cleverly took out the, the line about the seals so he didn't lose the mark there. So he gained an extra half mark. Um, and I can't, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the name of the person that actually put in a med arb clause. Ooh, you know, I get goosebumps when I see someone to do that because I talked about a med arb, med mediation and arbitration clause. Um, all right, so that is that, and if you have any questions about your uh, contract assignment, then what I want you to do is to um, uh, highlight it in yellow and just send me an email. Um, but please uh, read over my material and listen to this carefully, because I don't want you to come in and say, well, what did I get wrong in my interest calculations? Um, <clears throat> uh, interest calculations. There will not be any interest calculations on the quiz, so I don't imagine you'll pay too much attention to when I post it. But um, I'm going to post how the interest calculations are done. Quickly, and this might not make sense without you actually seeing it, is um, <clears throat> on November 16th, how much money is owing? $20,000. Five has already been paid. So $20,000 is outstanding from November the 16th until December the 15th. Take the $20,000, you multiply it by 0.65%, okay, but it's only outstanding for 29 days, so you put 29 over 365 and you get the amount. Okay, then after the payment is made on December the 15th, from then until January 15th, how many days? 31. Okay, how much money is outstanding? Well, another 10 has been paid. 
on December 15th. So it's only 10,000 outstanding times the interest rate, 0 0.065, times 31 days over 365, and then you get the second interest payment. Now, if you don't add the interest payments together and then divide by two to make the payments equal, because the problem does not say the payments that are made are equal. And you're all saying, oh, no, it does say that. No, it doesn't. Go back and read it. What it says is <clears throat> on the December 15th and on January 15th, there will be half the amount outstanding paid. So on December the 15th, 10,000 is paid. On, on January 15th, 10,000 is paid. On December the 15th, 10,000 is paid plus interest, not plus the whole, whole amount of the interest divided by two. No, just plus interest. So it's the inter first interest payment on top of that. And it's like, um, and I can tell you very quickly if I've got it handy. <coughs> Yes, here it is. Um, $103.29. So $10,103.29 is paid on December the 15th. And then the amount outstanding on January the 15th of interest is $55.20. So on January the 15th, $10,000, um, $10,055.20 is paid. Okay, I'll post that just so that you've got the calculations. All right, I think that has beaten that to death. Um, <clears throat> again, if you have any questions, um, think it through and then send them to me, and I will uh, post this video, and then I'll get on to the second video, which is the uh, contract drafting sheet. And the reason I'm giving that to you is we do the, um, in chapter three, very exhaustively, the academic aspect of contracts, the six binding elements, everything that has to be there, <clears throat> methods of lapse and stuff like that. But we don't talk a lot about the actual drafting of the contract. And so this sheet will give you some indication of the drafting of the material. All right, that's enough on this video. And um, we'll uh, see you in the next one.